So I'm Gabriel, I'm one of the neonatologists here. Nice to meet you all. And we're going to be doing uh, ECG back to the basics. So the beginning will be a bit more kind of uh, the boring part about, you know, this ancestral science and art that is called ECG, uh, which tries to capture the electricity of the heart, uh, knowing that the heart, especially in neonates and pediatric, may have very specific confirmation. Uh, ECG can provide you with a lot of information, both about rhythm issues, as well as uh, actually architecture issues uh, that's ongoing with neonates. So all in all, the electrocardiogram is a graphic representation of the electrical current that is generated to trigger the cardiac contraction of the various cardiac chambers. And uh, you can use ECGs to um, really evaluate uh, ev uh, elements such as acquired or uh, congenital defects of the heart. It's also an important tool for follow-up for some of the patients that may have cardiac conditions or conditions that can affect the heart. So you can think of pulmonary hypertension, which uh, if you follow the ECG, you can start seeing changes in your voltages of the right-sided heart structures. Uh, so it can be used for these reasons, uh, but also if you have uh, any concern for arrhythmias. And uh, the whole um, field of uh, arrhythmia, uh, arrhythmology is a, is a big field. There's specialists like cardiologists and electrophysiologists, and there's particularities with age. So we're really going to go through the basics today, but you must know that um, if you put the heart under stress or if you put uh, a patient under prolonged monitoring, you may be able to capture other things that you won't necessarily capture on a simple ECG of one time point, right? Because our heart rate in terms of behavior will change depending on the certain loading conditions and stress conditions. So um, we tend to use a vectorial approach, a bit like uh, being very mathematic when we look at the ECG, and so we'll try to do that today. But first we'll talk about how is the standard tracing that you'll see in pretty much every hospital. So typically on the first part, you'll have something called the frontal plane information, which is really saying like frontal. Then you have the horizontal plane information, which is the cross cut of the heart on this plane here. So it's the cross section of the heart. Typically you'll have at some point a calibration marker. We'll talk about the calibration marker, what it means. And you have a rhythm strips with by, def, by uh, standardization, typically is lead two. That provides you information about the rhythm over the entire uh, course of the recording. So tracings may have different standards. But uh, what we typically use for the recording in most machine uh, is what we call the 25 millimeters per second, uh, which involves that uh, on the sheet of paper, one millimeter involves 0 0.04 second, and one millimeter corresponds to one of those tiny boxes. When you take a bigger box, which is five millimeter, it equates to 200 millisecond, which is 0.2 seconds. Uh, another standard is that a current of one millivolt generated by your heart uh, will give a deflection of about 10 millimeters on the height. And so you have to be aware of calibration because sometimes if voltages are very high, especially in the context of hypertrophy or hypotrophy of a side of the heart, you might have changes in the calibration that you need to do to fit in all your waves uh, within the bandwidth of the, of the paper. So this is what we've mentioned. That's the standard calibration, 0 0.04 second or uh, five millimeters being 0 0.2 seconds. So when we talk about the standard or front uh, frontal leads, we can start with uh, the leads that we typically will uh, look into when we assess the heart. So lead one is typically from the right arm to the left arm, knowing that in most individuals, the heart has the apex pointing towards the left side. So if you have congenital heart defect or congenital anomalies that will change the position of your heart, you may pick up some changes in your ECG based on the actual vector of where the current is passing and which direction it's taking. So typically um, we have lead one, which is the right arm to the left arm. It's a positive wave if the wave travels from the right arm to the left arm. Lead two is from the right arm to the left leg. So the wave will be positive if it travels towards the left leg from the right arm. And lead three is this time from the left leg to the left arm. So it's kind of inverted in terms of the approach. The unipolar leads are specifically related to the AVR for right arm, AVL for left arm, and AVF for foot or left leg. So this is if you look at 
at what we call the Eitoven Triangle, which describes all these elements of the frontal leads, which are trying to capture the movement of electricity on the frontal plane. So we talk about lead one, which is looking this way, lead two this way, and lead three this way, with a heart that is mostly uh, pointing towards the left, typically. And then uh, AVR for right arm, AVL for left arm, and uh, AVF for foot or left leg. When we talk about the precordial leads, it's trying to capture the electricity current on a cross-sectional plane of the, of the body. So you're really doing a cut through the middle, and you're trying to understand where is the electricity going. Is it going towards the anterior portion of the, the body, the posterior portion of the body, the left or the right of the body? So it's not about caudal, cranial, left and right. It's about anterior, posterior, left and right. So... We have uh, multiple leads that can be placed in that field. The typical ones that you will see is V1 to V6, which are the typical ones that will have a tendency to use in pedi well uh, older pediatric and adults. Uh, neonates are a bit of a particular population, and we'll talk about it, uh, because neonates have a tendency to have more of a central type of position of the heart, and sometimes even they'll have um, more of their right-sided structure being more predominant in early life. So sometimes we'll actually uh, use um, the reverse side of the leads. So we can use the V3R or the V4R, which will be placed on the other side of the sternum to better capture the voltages of the right heart, or what we assume to be the right heart underlying. So V1 to V6, you can continue to V7, V8, and then sometimes you can go towards V3, V5, V4, V5R, which are basically the symmetric of V3, V4, V5 on uh, the other aspect of, of the heart. Um, can you put them all together? You can put, so tip, the, the channels are typically going to be six channels. Right. So if you do end up changing the position of your electrode, it needs to be documented on the ECG. And you can say V3 is V3R, V4 is V4R, or you can write V3 is actually V7, for example. V3. So it might be used in patients where you have uh, weird placements of the heart, or if they had surgery, for example, and uh, or CDH, where the heart might be uh, posteriorly positioned. So sometimes you have to adjust if you want to capture the voltages of the different portions of the heart. Um, and that's if you do transcutaneous ECG, these leads. I'm not going over anything that's related to epicardial volt uh, ECG, atrial ECGs, and things like that, that you may use if you follow patients in the post-cardiac surgical care. So that's the representation of V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Um, and you can see that it tries to capture the electricity of the different structures that are facing the apex of the heart. So all in all, you have typical ECG leads that are transcutaneous and that are representing uh, the frontal plane and the cross-sectional planes. And just so you're aware, if your deflection is going, let's say, towards V5 or V6, the electrical current will appear as positive. If it goes away, so if, for example, for some reason, your electrical current is going towards backwards, so towards posterior, it will appear as negative deflections. And so there are balances between the different hearts that will provide you different voltages of deflections, either positive or negative, or sometimes they cancel them out, depending on uh, what's the uh, direction of the current. So think of many cars on the island of Montreal, all going somewhere. If you average out the direction of all these cars together, you might have a particular direction of movement of these cars, but they may all be going in different direction individually. So it's the same thing when you look about the electrical current going through a structure. The electrical current might be actually spreading everywhere, but if you're trying to take a snapshot from a particular angle, the overall average of the direction of the electrical current may be coming towards the, a particular direction all in all. And that's what we're trying to capture through the ECG. Are you going to explain a bit more about the reverse one or not? Not much, actually. Can you go back to that? Yes. So then the four, five, six will be going to the... This way. Line? Yeah. So and exactly. The V6 is typically exactly at the anterior uh, axillary line. And it's going to go... So Maybe. you're going to take the V6 and you're going to put the actual V6 on the other side and you're going to call it V6R on the ECG. 
you actually have to either program it on the machine or manually write it on the ECG after that. So when you do that, it'll the heart is supposed to go on the other side, so it won't be negative. It won't be negative. So like, let's well, it depends the situation. Okay. Let's say you're doing this for ascites and versus. You're right, right. You're gonna put all your leads inverted, and you're gonna put everywhere R R R R R. Okay. And it's gonna appear possibly like a normal expected ECG for the age. Gotcha. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we use a vectorial approach, exactly what I just said, to try to capture the average direction of the electricity um, in the 3D plane using all these leads that are capturing the interior, posterior, left and right, and as well as cranial and caudal. Standard and unipolar informs on the frontal plane, precordial inform on the horizontal plane, and basically think of the leads like camera that are film filming in different planes. So you're looking at the heart, like, for example, if it was on the table, you can use a camera to take a picture from the front, from the back, from under the table, from above the table. And these pictures may provide you information uh, or a bit more comprehensive information about how exactly is this structure behaving. So you can see that there's different degrees of plane in that exa-axial uh, system uh, in order to understand the overall average directionality of this current. Okay, this is if you put it uh, an, an adult uh, person. So same thing, we talked about the horizontal plane where the different uh, elements will provide you information about direction. And then here in older pediatric and adult, we expect that the axis of the QRS, the P and the T axis will appear in exactly this zone. So I just marked it here and you'll have access to the slides on the website uh, after that. So each element of the ECG tracing represents a portion of the cardiac cycle. So typically, the ECG itself is the electrical current that will activate your heart in order to eventually lead to a contraction that will lead to ejection of blood flow in the outflow tract and provide blood flow to the organs or to the lungs. So as you know, within the cardiac cycle, there's different structure that are getting activated at different times. So if we follow here the cardiac cycle, you have the P wave that is initially uh, the uh, deflection that will uh, allow for your atrial contraction. So if you follow the actual uh, pressure curves, you can see that as you get your electrical activation of your atriums, you get eventually your A wave in terms of the pressure curve, which represents the atrial contraction. As the atrium is relaxing, we know that eventually the ventricle will start contracting and ejection the outflow tract. So for that, you need uh, R, a QRS R deflection, which will activate the ventricles. We'll speak about each of these phases and what they represent. This will allow ventricular contraction, which hopefully will be harmonious and not occur in a chaotic manner. And this contraction will eventually lead to relaxation. And typically, there is also what we call current or electrical relaxation, which we call usually repolarization of the ventricle. Every cell of myocardium get depolarized, which means they get activated, and eventually they relax or they become uh, repolarized in terms of the electrical current. I'm not gonna get into all the sodium channel and calcium pumps about how this occurs, but there is a certain automaticity of all the cells in the heart. Although we do have pacemakers in the heart, that tend to override the automaticity of all these other cells, okay? And then the cycle restarts. So the reason we don't see the portion of repolarization of the atrium on a regular ECG is that it's typically buried around the QRS time. That's the first thing. And um, here the T wave is typically the repolarization deflection of the ventricles. So we'll we spoke about depolarization of atrium. We'll talk about the AV node delay, which is this uh, interval. Uh, then we have the QRS, and then eventually we get the repolarization of the ventricles. So when we look at automaticity of the heart, we think about, well, we need a pacemaker to actually trigger what will be the rate of that heart. And what we have in the heart is typically the SA node which can be damaged or destroyed depending on what's happening to the baby. So for example, infants who have certain types of myocarditis, infants who have certain types of structural heart defects, 
who have uh, atrial anomalies, they can have uh, sinus node uh, diseases, okay? Um, and typically the SA node is uh, positioned at the level of the IVC junction to right atrium. That's typically the uh, place where they sit in the normal heart. And because of that, the typical axis of the vector is what we call zero to 90 degrees. And we'll see what that means. What really the axis means of this wave is that if you start in the right atrium, you spread towards the left atrium and you spread towards the ventricle. So you go from the right to the left and down uh, caudal. Uh, so it has a direction of zero to 90 degrees for that reason. Um, so there are particularities by age and morphology of the individual. Uh, we just mentioned that for newborns, you may have differences in terms of the shape of the heart or the plane where the heart will sit. Uh, and eventually, uh, as you grow and become adult, you tend to take the position of being more towards the left side of the chest. So some of these standards, and there are a few that have been published through the years, um, are available and uh, often are regrouped in terms of tables. There are also standards for prem premature babies also. It's been uh, described. Uh, um, and so this particular table is for babies that are born at term. And you can see that within the first few months of life, which is kind of the neonate, there is a lot of changes. So less than one day, one to two days, three to six days, one to three weeks, one to two months. And then here you can see that there are some changes in the PR interval that are considered to be normal. Uh, frontal plate QRS vector, heart rate, and then the different voltages in terms of hypertrophy or not. And I've provided here another uh, reference uh, from Tintinelli. Uh, and I'm not going to go over all the voltages. So if we talk about following the cardiac cycle, we start with the P wave, which is typically the activation of the atrium from the SA node or the sinoatrial node, which leads to depolarization of the atriums. Then you can see that there is a pause here. So someone knows what's this pause? What it the, represents, the, the pause? The atrium um, depolarization. So actually, this pause, which we call the PQ interval, is the zone of where the current sits in the AV node. So an AV node is a station which builds up current and wait for, and it allows a delay for the atrial contraction to be finished so that the ventricular contraction doesn't occur at the same time as the atrial contraction. That's why there's a little pause, because once the current is triggered, the ventricle will contract very quickly. So by allowing a certain pause to happen through the EV node, you allow atrial contraction to be completed, and eventually the current passes through the ventricles and allows ventricular contraction to happen after this atrial contraction is completed. So there are diseases that can occur, which will prolong the PQ or prolong what we call the overall PR interval. Okay, so PR interval can be increased in what conditions? So hard blocks can be one of the condition or situations where you get some um, overall issues with your atrial conduction can also impact the PR interval. Okay, so combined time required for atrial repolarization and conduction for the AV node, giving you your PQ interval. Then eventually, once you reach your AV node and your AV node is ready to trigger the depolarization of the ventricle, it will launch current through something called the bundle of Hiss, which is a very rapid highway to conduct electricity through the septum and eventually through the ventricles. So the AV node itself has different structures, which also can be damaged or have specific disease to themselves. The Hiss uh, bundle eventually will divide into bundle branch, which can also be affected by specific disease or can be affected by specific configuration of the heart. So we know, for example, that if you talk about congenitally corrected transposition of great arteries, which is a disease of the heart, uh, which is often associated with what we call heterotaxia, they have a tendency to have anomalies of pathways like this. And that's specifically important for the surgeon to know the exact anatomy of the heart, because when they're going to come and sew some of the patches for the VSD, it can impact where they're going to actually do the sutures because they might injure some of these bundles. So the particular configuration of the heart may impact how these bundles behave in the newborn. Uh, 
so activation of ventricle goes through bundle of his and crooked G fibers. Then you get depolarization of the superior part of the septum from the left to the right. So that's one thing that's important is that typically our septum gets depolarized from left to right and not the inverse, not right to left. So typically our right atrium gets depolarized right to left, and eventually we get depolarization of the septum left to right, and then you get conduction through the ventricles, and both ventricles free wall are getting depolarized at the same time um, with uh, contraction and depolarization first of the apex and eventually toward the base of the heart. The reason is that you want to contract first your apex and you get your contraction so that it kind of squishes from the bottom up the blood towards the alpha tract. So nature is kind of made well. <laughs> um, so uh, this is important because it provides mostly information when you have issues where you're considering that there could be some ischemia or infarction, uh, because deep Q waves can be a sign that you have issues with um, some sub endocardial ischemia, especially in adults, but also in patients who have, for example, Kawasaki disease, coronary anomalies, uh, diseases like Alcapa, uh, which is anomalous coronary uh, placement uh, towards the pulmonary artery instead of the aorta. So there are situations where you need to pick the, these anomalies up, but also situations where QAs will be abnormal or situations such as if you don't have a, a, a septum. So for example, single ventricles may, may have anomalies of QAs uh, placement because they just don't have a septum or the septum is very minimal. Um, repolarization of the ventricle is the T wave, and the QT segment is the time of the depolarization and repolarization of your ventricles. So it encompasses the whole kind of spectrum of depolarization and repolarization. Hello, hello. You can take a seat. Sure. So, uh, oops, I guess I'm going to just put it down there. So my approach towards reading an ECG is trying to be as systematic as possible. So usually I try to look at, first of all, well, how does my uh, paper look like? So what's my standardization in terms of voltages, amplitude? Could there be artifacts such as hiccups, high frequency ventilation, or uh, other types of interference with the capture of my ECG? What's the rhythm looking like? So is it a regular rhythm or irregular rhythm of the different Q QRS complexes? Uh, and is it sinus? We'll talk about what sinus really means. Uh, what's the frequency for my age? Is it uh, too fast, too slow within normal uh, uh, normal rate? So I look at the frequency. If I see that there's a disconnect between my P wave and my QRS, I look at both the frequency of the atrial contraction and the frequency of my ventricular contraction. Uh, so, for example, you might have a control heart block where you're going to have uh, a very normal frequency of atriums, but then your ventricular escape is at 40 per minute. And that's important because that's your functional kind of heart rate. Then I look at the axis of the different segments. So what's the axis of my QRS, of my P and my T? Uh, what are the time intervals of importance? And then when I look specifically at the P wave, I look, are they present? Are they associated with the QRS? Is the QRS itself associated with the P wave? And what's the duration and amplitude of these P waves? I look at the QRS amplitude, and then if I have a suspicion that there might be uh, hypertrophy or hypotrophy, I might look at some of my ratios between the different leads that may represent what I assume to be the right or the left heart. Um, I look at some of the ST segment and T wave anomalies, as well as if we have to keep in mind signs of intoxication or electrolyte uh, abnormalities. So that's the first example of when you look at your standardization. We mentioned earlier that you can change your standardization of your paper. So voltages and amplitudes, when you look at the calibration, you can see here that this is your typical calibration. So A is one millimeter equals 10, uh, sorry, 10 millimeters equaled one millivolt. B tells you that here in the frontal leads, it's uh, one, uh, 10 millimeter equals one millivolt, but in the precordial lead, so the cross section V1 to V6, you actually change your calibration where one, uh, five millimeters equal one millivolt. This is uh, both the precordial and the frontal leads are at um, five millimeter equals one millivolt. Then in D, you see that this one was dropped even further. So it means we dropped even further the precordial ones. Uh, this one means we augmented uh, the calibration. 
And this one means that uh, a part is augmented, which is the frontal plane and the horizontal plane is not. So again, the calibration marker is typically either on the completely right-sided uh, portion of the ECG or left-sided portion of the ECG. Here we have it on the left side. It's here. It's on this side. So then you look, we, when you look at certain types of arrhythmias, we're often called to look at monitors, for example. And you have to think about, could it be an artifact? Could it be because the baby is coughing or has a hiccups? Or uh, sometimes one of the very frequent uh, ventricular arrhythmias uh, that you see on monitor, you get to the bedside and someone is uh, trying to burp the, burp the baby, like, tut, 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 you know, like, and then you realize the baby's completely fine. So you just have to keep in mind that there could be some of these arrhythmias. And if you're looking at an ECG and you're not looking at your baby, you might uh, do a disconnect between your interpretation of the ECG and actually the real situation of what's happening. So think about movement, uh, breathing, uh, muscle tremor, and sometimes skin resistance. Um, then uh, we look at the rate, as we mentioned. So there's many ways to calculate the rate, uh, either of your P wave or of your QRS. Uh, the rapid estimation that many of you have learned is the famous 300, 150, 175. So you start with the first uh, QRS on one of the big lines, and then you start counting down. And if your QRS is here, well, you know it's around 125. If your crest is here, well, you know that it's around 88. Uh, so it gives you a sense of what's the rate. That's a quick trick. There are many, many different ways. You can take the R distance in seconds and divide by 60. So for example, here, um, you have a 28 of distance times 0 0.04 second. It gives you 1.12 seconds. So if you have 1.12 seconds between each uh, two uh, QRS, uh, you do 60 divided by 1.12 and gives you an average per minute. And that if obviously it's regular. Okay. Uh, if you have a slow rate, you can do the number of boxes between two RR and you divide by 300. So 300 small boxes equal one minute in the regular calibration. So for example, between these two, you have 5.8 boxes. So you can do 300 divided by 5.8. It gives you 52 per minute. And there are many other tricks, like number of R cycle versus large boxes. Uh, you multiply by 50 and gives you 150 per minute. So, you know, I see a lot of people, what they do, they actually just look at the rhythm strip and what the computer has uh, calculated for them. Uh, it does do mistakes when it's irregular. So you might want to look first at your P uh, rate and calculate it. And then you look at your ventricular rate and calculate it and see if there is a disconnect, because that's important. And then you have, um, you depending if it's in a arrhythmia or a block, uh, you might calculate your rate different ways. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over all this. So as we mentioned, the typical thresholds in adults for bradycardia and tachycardia are not applicable to babies, right? So in babies, you would expect a much higher heart rate. So we used to say 93 to 154 is kind of the range that we expect for term babies. But we see many babies in our unit, you know, because they're often born preemie or preterm or they're a bit stressed and they're in the like 160, 170. And we fluctuate in time. It's normal to have a heart rate variability. It's actually expected. It's a sign that there's uh, integrity of your brainstem. And uh, we should be uh, varying our heart rate. We shouldn't be always constantly at a specific heart rate. But when you reach the 200 uh, levels, you start being concerned about the tachycardia. And when you start being uh, below the 100 consistently, you start becoming a bit worried, especially if the baby is awake. The baby is deep asleep, a term baby. You can sometimes be in the 95 per minute, uh, 90 per minute. But uh, to be awake at uh, 80 per minute, uh, there's a concern that there's a bradycardia, which could be the reflection of another process, uh, like a baby becoming sick, sepsis, acidosis, other things like that. So when we look at tachycardia and bradycardia, there are many, many, many various reasons. We'll try to briefly address some of those. So in tachycardia, we often talk about sinus tachycardia, re-entry types of tachycardia, ventricular level tachycardia, fibrillation and flutter of the atrium. And in bradycardia, we talk about sinus bradycardia, junctional rhythm, and some of the AV blocks like second degree and third degree. Um, the average axis informs you about, as I said, the direction of the electrical current, and you can have a direction of electrical current for both your P wave and your QRS, okay? 
So when you do your access, of course, we have a tendency to look at the axis of your QRS, but it's important to see what's the, QR, the axis of your P wave because it tells you if it's actually a sinus rhythm or not. Mm-hmm. Sinus rhythm, when you say the patient is in sinus rhythm, it means that your, P, your electrical current originates from a P wave that is coming from the SA node. So if the SA node doesn't exist or if it exists or and it's misplaced, the actual current axis of your P wave will be different than expected. And so you cannot call it a sinus rhythm, okay? Um, So typically you have to look at this axis of the P wave, which should be coming from uh, the right arm in going towards the left side of the body and going down caudal, okay? So it's typically positive in one and positive in AGF. But, so, uh, Dr. Walter, yeah. is it in any case related to the heart rate? Because many people relate the heart rate with the sinus rhythm. If it's very low, they say, okay, it's sinus rhythm. Don't worry about that. Usually. When you say it's sinus rhythm, it just means it just means that your rhythm is coming from the SA node. That's the only thing it means. So you can be bradycardic because your P wave is triggered at a low pace and be in sinus rhythm. Or you could be bradycardic and not be in sinus rhythm, but still have a P wave, like an escape rhythm. So you may or may not have hemodynamic instability in a sinus, a sinus rhythm. We're not talking about hemodynamic stability. We're not talking about ventricular contraction. I'm just talking about rhythm today. So when you have a patient and you say this is sinus, you could be in sinus arrhythmia, uh, but... Being in sinus rhythm means your P wave is coming from the expected SA node, which means that you have to be positive in one and positive in ADF. That's the only thing it means. Does that clarify? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but I cannot say it's physiological. Like sin- when I when I use the term physiological, it means uh, sinus rhythm means it's still a physiological state, right? So you can be very bradycardic and be in sinus rhythm and be very much so not physiologic, right? You put put an ECG at a baby in the delivery room who has a heart rate of 30 Mm -hmm. and he's dying and he's in apnea and you put an ECG and you are in sinus rhythm. There's nothing physiological in this patient. You have to ventilate, intubate the baby. He's in apnea. He's, you know, but he's still in sinus rhythm. He's not in an arrhythmia, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. Yeah. So being bradycardic could be an abnormal state, but it doesn't mean that the bradycardia is caused by an arrhythmia or an abnormal conduction or abnormal rhythm. It could just be that your SA node is very slow yeah. and it's the reflection that there's a stress that is ongoing in this baby. Now it's for you to determine what's the stress. Is it because he's apneic? Is it because he's not breathing? Is it because he's septic? Is it because he has a pneumothorax or a pericardial effusion. So it's a response. It's a it's a vagal response. It clarifies? Yeah. For it example, does. like in the AV block, this is pathological, not physiological, but the P wave can still do So this is sinus, especially the first degree. Yeah, your P wave could still be sinus. Yeah, Absolutely. Electricity, electric activity starts from there. Absolutely. So you can be in a sinus P wave on congenital heart block, because yes. your P wave is still originating from the sinus rhythm, from the SA node, but you're not, you're still in an arrhythmia situation because you have a block. The AV node is problematic at this point. So um, the P deviation can mean one or more pacemaker foci. And typically the normal sinus rhythm is means the P wave of the uh, has a normal axis <laughs> with a normal PR preceding each QRS. So normal axis, positive or isoelectric in lead one and AVF. Uh, Okay, perfect. We're going to go on. So we typically do for uh, when we assess the axis, uh, the successive approximation type of approach, which means that we typically look at our our regular um, leads and it provides us with a sense of where on the frontal plane the QRS axis or the P wave axis is gone going. And then we look also on the frontal, on the cross-sectional precordial leads uh, to understand uh, what's happening on the cross-sectional section. So, uh, for example, if your QRS is positive in lead one, it means that uh, it's going from the right side to the left side. And if it's positive in AVF, it means it's coming from the cranial to the caudal. It's going down. Um, So, for example, 
we would expect to be positive going towards that direction and going towards the foot. And then similarly, uh, you expect that uh, your lead, um, it's going to go towards anterior. So the shaded area was the direction. Exactly. So um, large scleroderma accident. Okay, we're going to stop. Yeah. So in the typical most condition of ECGs you're going to read, uh, if you're positive in Lee 1, positive in AVF, it means that you're between this 0 to 90 degrees. If you're positive in Lee 1, negative in AVF, it means you're going this way, which means your voltage is going towards the head. Mm -hmm. If you're negative in Lee 1 and positive in AVF, it means it's going towards the right side, but uh, going uh, uh, towards uh, the foot. And if it's negative in both, it means it's going towards the right side and going towards the head. OK, and typically newborns are kind of situated between this minus 30 to kind of 100 degree. That's kind of the normal QRS axis for for newborns. Uh, so, you know, this normal range was kind of more the pediatric and adults, but this provides you with information on where these uh, QRS uh, would would appear to be positive. So uh, that's why I said minus 30 to 90 degrees is typically the normal newborn, um, the newborn QRS axis uh, for, for the QRS. So for example, if we would look at this particular patient, this patient is positive in, in, in one and it's positive in AVF. So we would expect uh, the axis of the QRS to go oh. towards where? This, this way. This way, right? So we see it here. And then this one is negative in one, and this is AVF, it's negative. So where would it be? Uh, it's the other side. Yeah. Okay, so negative in one. So this isn't one, okay? Yeah. So if it's not going towards one, it's going towards the right side. Okay. And if it's if it's not going towards AVF, it means it's going up. So where would you expect it? Upper left. Upper left. Right. In this zone. In this zone. Right, yeah. okay, perfect. Okay, so you're all expert at access. There are other methods. I'm not going to go through the graphic method. You'll have it access on my slides. So you can do like uh, a whole like um, like Excel spreadsheet like this <laughs> and then start calculating the different angles and then join the angles. And that provides you like really with what basically what the machine is doing, like the ECG machine is doing, it's kind of this method to really calculate the exact kind of direction of your voltages. Uh, it's exactly the same exercise. One in AVF is here. Um, so, yeah. So the P wave and sinus rhythm uh, origin is from the SA node. The first part is the activity of the anterior portion of the right atrium. And the second part is typically the activity of the left atrium. And so the typical axis is also between 0 to 90, but is more like between 50 to 80. Uh, and it provides you, when it's within this uh, range, a sense that it's probably originating from the SA node. So if you see here, this patient has a normal SA node going towards the AV node, and the spread of electricity is going towards the left atrium. If your foci is not the SA node, the T wave axis will be different. So in that case, this patient in lead one, uh, sorry, in uh, lead two or AVF will have a different axis because this is going up. So it will it would appear negative in lead in lead AVF and in lead two. Okay. The duration also of the P wave informs you on certain aspects of the heart integrity. So uh, typically in less than 12 months old, it's less than 0 0.08 seconds. And if it's longer than that, you need to start thinking about left atrial enlargement or hypertrophy or dilatation. Um, and if you start having notched into your uh, P wave, it might um, tell you that there is a differential effect on the right and the left atrium. The height also provides you information about hypertrophy and dilatation, mostly in lead V1 and V2. Um, okay, so this is an example. Uh, if you're in a situation where you have a higher uh, P wave, uh, you can consider that this is um, right atrial hypertrophy. If you have a longer, it's typically because of left atrial hypertrophy um, and you have uh, bi atrial hypertrophy, typically they're both wider and, uh, and taller. So I've provided you here. So typically what we look into, we look in lead two and V1. Uh, that's after you establish the axis of your P wave. Uh, 
you look at the voltages of your P wave to inform you on, is there a pathology underlying like uh, atrial enlargement? Um, and so in the normal aspect, you get this kind of arch wave that is very harmonious in V2. Uh, and then similarly, you do get sometimes a bit of a negative notch, but typically it's it's like this. If you do get right atrial hypertrophy, you can see that in lead two, you start having the taller or the spreading. If you get left atrial hypertrophy, and if it's bi atrial hypertrophy, you typically both get taller and spreading. So lead two is often your rhythm strip at the bottom of your ECG. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, you can look at the shape of the P wave in that uh, strip and already get a sense if there's anomalies of your, of your, uh, of your P wave. So here in babies, uh, usually we're about 1.5 millimeter. If you're more than three, you're definitely in a range of right atrial enlargement. And normally you're at 0 0.06 seconds, so three little boxes. If you're more than that, or even more than 0 0.1 seconds, you're definitely in a range of left atrial enlargement. So we spoke um, about the normal axis. If you don't have a normal axis, you have to start thinking about anomalies that could be explaining that. So we can think about, for example, atrial inversions. So kids who have congenital, different types of congenital uh, heterotaxia. So uh, they can have uh, the left atrium on the right side of the body and the right atrium on the left side of the body. So if you're thinking also of situs inverses, you might have changes in that axis. Um, your electrodes is often the principal cause. So if you look at, if you see anomalies of your axis, make sure that your electrodes were connected appropriately. Um, and then P wave in the superior axis, we can think about uh, junctional rhythm, atrial fibrillation, uh, SA node block, and, and, and other things like that. Can someone recognize this rhythm? It looks like a sawtooth. Hi. Flutter. So that's just an example of atrial flutter. So when you're looking at multiple P waves for each QRS, you have to start thinking of, uh, is there a block that's causing that? Or is it because my atriums are, contraction, are contracting way too quickly that my ventricles are not able to follow? And if they're contracting way too quickly, it's typically in a situation where the, uh, the baby is not having bradycardia. Typically, they are able to maintain a normal ventricular rhythm. It's just that when atrium keeps on depolarizing, the ventricles are not able to follow. And often it's because there's an AFib or an atrial flutter. Uh, we're not gonna talk about wandering pacemaker. The PR interval informs you on uh, AV node conduction, as we mentioned. Um, and so uh, we can have short PR intervals or prolonged PR intervals. Short PR intervals is often because there's something called pre-excitation, which means that somewhere in the heart, there is a bundle of, of conducting tissue that is able to pass, bypass the AV node delay station and conduct the electrical current very quickly from the atrium to the ventricular station. So if you have these kinds of pathways, they could either be inside the AV node or outside the AV node, okay? And this situation may lead you to something called re-entry, which leads to eventually what we call supraventricular tachycardia. So that's a typical reason of why you would have a short PR interval, is if you have these kinds of bundles that are able to bypass the AV node delaying station, okay? If it's prolonged, then you have to think about, you know, myocarditis, congenital heart block, and, uh, you know, previous rheumatic fever if you're thinking about kind of older kids. Um, okay, so increased PR interval is one of the first sign of what we call first degree AV block. It's typically because your AV node is starting to suffer something, so usually some degree of inflammation or ischemia. Uh, and we, uh, it will behave as a patient who has a normal rhythm most of the time, uh, both on the P wave and QRS. And typically every P wave will continue to conduct, but uh, your PR may start prolonging because the AV node is uh, suffering some degree of inflammation. We can also see increased PR interval in certain diseases like Epstein and atrial ventricular septal defect. Uh, if you have toxicity like hyperkalemia, ischemia, and if you start doing vagal stimulation, you're going to cause changes in conduction of your AV node, and it will lead to a prolongation of your PR interval. 
And we take advantage of that to actually treat SVT. Mm -hmm. So we try to break the reentry cycle by prolonging the conduction of one of the pathways, which is typically the AV node that we can manipulate by using the uh, vagal stimulation. Okay, 15 minutes left. So PR interval will change based on age. This is just one of the graphs outlining from zero to 98%. Uh, same thing. So this was in lead two based on age, and this is lead two based on heart rate because heart rate will also modulate your PR interval. So after first degree AV block, we can talk also about second degree AV block. Do you guys know the second degree AV block? Mm -hmm. Type one, type two. Yeah. What is the difference? One is like gradually prolonged, it's the other one is like. Exactly. So the Mobitz type one or Weckenbach, I don't know if it's still used, but probably not. I'm too old. Um, it's the PR interval will progressively increase and eventually you get one drop beat. The Mobitz type two is typically you get your P wave, your PR, your QRS, your P wave, your PR, your QRS, and P wave, and boom, there's nothing that happens. Um, and sometimes you can have what we call a two to one uh, second degree block, which means you get one P wave, one QRS, one P wave, nothing, one P wave, one QRS, one P wave, one nothing. So um, this is a sign that there's also anomalies at the level of your uh, AV node. Uh, so Mobitz type one or working back is progressive increase of the PR until you get a QRS drop and Mobitz type two is normal PR and sudden loss of QRS. And typically this is the sign that there's some degree of injury to some of these His fibers, uh, which is a bit deeper in the conducting system. Uh, we spoke about two to one block. The third degree block is a complete dissociation. So atrium are doing whatever they want on their side and ventricles are doing whatever they want on their side. And whatever station is in between, which is the AV node is burnt, mm -hmm. is not able to pass the conduction. So typically there are cells with certain degree of automaticity, which will take over for survival. And these cells will have their own inherent um, rhythm. So we talk often either about the junctional cells or the ventricular cells. Junctional means it's at the junction. Junction is typically the AV node, but you can have zones below the AV node that are still at the junction that can take over the role of pacemaker. Typically, depending on the position of that pacemaker, the shape of your QRS deflection will be different. So for example, if you have a, a, a junctional rhythm escape, how will your QRS look like? Yeah. It will be narrow because it will use the usual pathways in order to activate the ventricle. If it's in the ventricle, it will be wide because depending on where it is, it needs to then travel at a much slower pace to activate the entire ventricular territory. So here, this is an example of first degree AV block. So you get P wave, prolonged PR, your QRS, but you always have P waves and always have QRS that follows that P wave. This is a Mobitz type one. So you get your um, P wave QRS, P wave QRS, the PR interval is very long, P wave, and then nothing. And then same thing, PR, PR increase, PR increases, and then P, nothing happens. Mobitz type two, you get your P wave QRS, P wave QRS, P wave QRS, and P wave and nothing happens. And then you can see that sometimes this P wave, so P wave QRS, P wave nothing, P wave QRS, P wave nothing. So this is a two to one kind of block here. And then finally, in the third degree of E block, the trick is to actually count the P, wave. count the P waves and mark the no P waves in between. and then mark the QRS. And you can see that the QRS are actually very regular. And the P wave are actually very regular. Where do you think this uh, QRS originates in terms of the pacemaker for this particular patient? Mm -hmm. Junctional or ventricular? Junctional. It's a junctional escape for them. Exactly. Oh, good. You guys are following. <laughs> Perfect. So I put here um, other types of, you know, basically what it what we just mentioned here. Uh, okay, that's the same with other tracing. It's a recap. Uh, I don't need to go over again. Again, first degree, type one, type two. So I put a few so you can see the tracings and how uh, different examples it looks like. 
Uh, so we spoke about short PR and talked about pre-excitation. There's many, many other disease that may lead to uh, short PR intervals. Typically, there are diseases that are metabolic or genetic. So you can think of pumping disease can also have this pattern. They typically also have very big voltages because they have significant hypertrophy. Uh, and then the variable PR interval is often associated with what we just said here, which is a Mobitz type 1. And there's also another disease which we call multifocal atrial tachycardia, which means that there's many pacemakers at the atrial level that will fire in kind of at a different pace. So sometimes one will take over, then another one will take over. And so the PR interval will depend on the traveling time from that foci to the AV nodes. So it might change a bit your PR interval if the electrical current has to travel a bit longer. This means the P morphology can be different. And the P morphology will also be different, exactly. So ventricular depolarization, we spoke about, uh, you know, prolonged versus, you know, wide versus narrow. So typically we talk about narrow when it's less than 0 0.1 seconds. Uh, if you have increased duration, it could be because of bundle branch block, complete or incomplete. It could be because you get intraventricular block, or it could be because there is pre-excitation. Uh, and then sometimes in certain types of arrhythmia, you may induce a bundle branch block because the bundle branches might not repolarize at a similar fashion. And so you, we call this often aberrancy, which means that not every part of the conducting system has already repolarized, and it's already so quick that they get reactivated that they, they, they may appear in a, in a more diffuse fashion because there is a part of the heart that has not been uh, repolarized still. Uh, so the duration in V5, there are normal values. And typically we speak about uh, more left heart uh, axis, which is pronounced in situation where you have LV hypertrophy or under development of your RV. So for example, patients with tricuspid atresia who has no RV, they will present with a left axis deviation, right? Similarly, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, they appear like right ventricular hypertrophy. It's not that the right heart is hypertrophied, is that there's no left heart. So the sum of all the, yeah. the current is uh, when you do the average, it looks like you have more right-sided forces. So for example, in a patient with hypoplastic left heart, the V1 voltages, the QRS are going to be very high, and your V6, V5, which are get closer to the left side, are very low, or they're actually very negative, because the massive amount of electricity is bulking into the right ventricle. And in, vice versa for like tricuspid atresia, which does not have typically a big right ventricle, it's almost, it's very hypoplast. So that's why the axis of your caress can also inform you based on the clinical situation, is there a congenital heart defect? So if you get a call from up north and a baby that's blue and they have an ECG and they send you the ECG, if the ECG is showing uh, left axis deviation and big atriums, there's not that many diagnoses it can be. It could be tricuspid atresia or it could be an Epstein anomaly. Uh, okay, similarly, we talked about right ward axis, IRV hypertrophy, congenital heart defect with RV predominance, such as hypoplastic left heart, or there's a right bundle branch block because there's a delay of conduction where eventually it gets to the right heart. Uh, and finally, if the QRS is superior, it's typically a sign that uh, we have what we call uh, AVSD. So, Q by convention is the first negative wave, R is the first positive wave, S is the second negative wave, R prime is often the positive after the S, S prime is the negative after the R prime. And if there's no positive wave, uh, we often say it's a QS interval. So large QS, we spoke about ventricular escape rhythms or ventricular tachycardia. If you have right or left bundle branch blocks, blocks you can end up with also larger QRS. Uh, and then, you know, often I hear like these bunny ears, they represent uh, some degree of uh, RSR prime, which can be a representation of block, but it sometimes in V1 can also represent an ASD. Yeah. Uh, so when we said PR interval are very short, this is what we mean by a pre-excitation. It means that you have these kind of um, 
T wave, and then right away you see that you get this conduction, and it can delay the duration of your QRS wave because you have this pre-excitation through another channel that is conducting more quickly rather than the AV node. But because often these channels are targeting cells at a particular place into the heart, then you get a delay of spread into, in terms of the rest of your mass of your ventricles. Uh, ventricular pacemaker, so when you have escape rhythms, it can prolong the QRS interval. And QRS without a specific pattern, so non-specific delay of intraventricular conduction. So often if you have like issues like intraventricular blocks, it can also delay. Um, so Q-wave, uh, you typically don't have any in V1. It's rare in lead one. And if you see a Q wave in V1, you have to think of situations like transposition of great arteries or single ventricles. Um, if deep and large, you have to start thinking of ischemia. So we spoke about Alcapa already, which is an, anom an anomaly of the coronary artery that's coming from the pulmonary artery instead of the aorta, which can lead to ischemia eventually of the heart. And if you start seeing uh, increased uh, voltages of your Q wave, uh, Q wave in V5, V6, you can think about left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, okay, so these are the different shape, like RSR prime or QRSR prime. Um, and just so you know, in V1, having an RSR prime is often a sign of an ASD. So that uh, is very typical in newborns to see that, and it's quite normal to have that. So ratio LV to RV, we know the RV is a bit more predominant uh, during neonatal life. And as you can see, it uh, gets to a ratio of 0 0.8 to 1 by 36 weeks. And then eventually at birth, um, you start reversing back towards uh, left-sided predominance as you go on towards adulthood. Uh, the amplitude of QRS are important to inform you on voltages for, for example, hypertrophy or hypotrophy. Uh, but as well as if there's pre-excitation and ventricular branch block. Decreased voltages. One of the things in the ICU you have to keep in mind, if decreased voltages, it could be either artifactual, so the electrodes are not good, but you have to think about pericardial effusion um, or other types of um, extrinsic effusion of the heart, which may delay the transmission of electricity to the skin. Uh, same thing, myocarditis can present with decreased voltages, and um, sometimes hypothyroidism also can present like this. I'm not going to go into the R and S. Uh, ST segment, I'm not going to talk about this. Digoxin, it's very rare that we use that. So Kawasaki is rare in newborns. Uh, infarction is also rare. So there is a segment on infarction. T wave. Um, also, I'm not going to talk about this. Um, one thing about T waves, it can change depending if you have situations like hyperkalemia. So it's important to still look at the shape of your T wave because situations like medications or viral uh, conditions can impact your ST segment uh, and it can mostly impact your QT segment. So we talk a lot about QT and QT prolongation. And the issue with QT prolongation is what? To, uh, side to the point. The point. Then... Exactly. So QT prolongation is often an obvious sign that either you have a syndrome that's leading to QT prolongation, where you have anomalies of repolarization of your ventricles, or you have issues like problem with electrolytes or intoxication of your heart, which is causing issue for the heart to repolarize. So paying attention to your T wave, if, they lo if it looks very prolonged, is of importance also. Not going to talk about the angle. Uh, so the QT interval, typically the QT will change with heart rate. So that's why we have to find a way to normalize it to the heart rate. So what do we typically do is that we look in lead two. We measure the uh, QT interval of one of the um, uh, cardiac cycles. And we compare it to the RR of the previous cardiac cycle. Okay, so it's always... A, a QT and then the RR of that previous cardiac cycle. And so the Bazet formula, which indexes to uh, kind of take into account the, uh, the heart rate, is that QT divided by the square root of the RR interval. And then typically we like to have uh, 0 0.45 and less uh, 
uh, if you're less than six months. So situation like hypocalcemia, ischemia, amiodarone, um, or like, for example, medication like cisapride and domperidone may impact your QT segment, which can lead to eventually arrhythmias. So QT interval, uh, do I have something here? Yes. So we take in lead two, we measure the Q to uh, the end of the T wave, and then we calculate the duration of that using the little boxes. Uh, and then we measure the RR behind. And so you're able to do, uh, this is 0 0.60 seconds divided by square root of 1.36 seconds, and it gives you 0 0.52. So you can see that this patient has QT prolongation. I think we're finished because we have m, &M So I'm not going to go on. This is GT, intervals, U-wave, hypertrophy, we addressed in many of the places. Bundle branch block, we addressed. Uh, we talked about bundle branch blocks. We talked about pre-excitation. And um, you had already presented on re-entry at one of the NICU cardio rounds, so I'm not going to repeat everything about that. But typically, you know, in SVT, what happens is that you get re-entry, and then typically you lose is what? What what are the hallmark of your ECG for SVT? Sorry. Hallmark of the ECG for SVT. No P wave. No, no P wave, or the P wave is retrograde. Like a very uh, and the R R intervals. The R R interval remains. R R interval tends to be very regular. It doesn't change, yeah. and yeah, typically your tachycard. Like, right. Yeah. Narrow depends. Narrow depends if um, your patient has aberrancy or not. So if, for example, I just mentioned, if it tries to conduct through the uh, bundle of his and the branches, and one of the branches, for example, is still in a process of repolarization, it won't conduct. So by the time the rest of the ventricle gets activated, it might cause to have a very wide complex tachycardia. It could still be SVT. That's why in certain situation of white complex tachycardia in a kid who has a pulse, you can try to give adenosine and see if it's going to break the cycle. If you don't have a pulse, it's another question, right? Like uh, you go CPR and you do a defib because then you assume it's ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. But in a situation where you have a pulse and a patient that's relatively stable, you can try to figure out what's the underlying arrhythmia and then give the adenosine. So... This presentation goes on and on with examples. So you can see it's many, many slides. Because um, usually the workshops are two hours. So at the end of it, you have cases with ECG to practice, and they have answers in them. So I have four copies that are printed for you guys. So yeah, so the, the actual um, examples are starting on page... Uh, well, they're, they're starting on page 29. You have the example, and then you have the answer of the ECG. Great. Okay. I'll take another. So take there you go. And then there's two other copies here. And I'll make available uh, the PDF also on the website that you can find it. Thank you, Thank you. Any question from whoever is still on? Yeah. 